Knox, the great uh, reformer in Scotland. And so I found some admirable qualities about him. And, and then I learned that he preached sermons that were up to three hours long. So I won't try to emulate that uh, for you uh, this morning, but I do have a message uh, uh, for you. The second part of our scripture reading from the Gospel of Luke, a continuation of the uh, reading from chapter 10, and so I'll be picking up at verse, uh, at verse 30. The question was asked of Jesus, who is my neighbor? And as so often is the case with uh, Jesus that we find in the gospel, rather than just answering the question, he answers in the form of a parable, a story, which has a way of kind of grabbing your attention because in a story there are characters and there are actions that uh, can create an image in your mind and can be helpful in learning what Jesus would have us know. So listen now to Jesus' response to the man who asked, who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers who stripped him, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. And so likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, while traveling, came near him. And when he saw him, he was moved with pity. He went to him and he bandaged his wounds, having poured oil and wine on them. And then he put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day, he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said, take care of him. And when I come back, I will repay you whatever more you spend. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? He said, the one who showed him mercy. Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts, our Heavenly Father, be in accordance to your will and your spirit, we pray. Amen. So if you look at a map of the Holy Land showing Jerusalem and Jericho, it would seem from a bird's eye view that this would be a pretty easy journey to make. It's a distance of only 18 miles. And even in these ancient times, of slow transportation, such as walking or perhaps riding on a donkey, it seems like it'd be a pretty doable trip and pretty simple. However, when you consider that the terrain looked like this, you quickly realize that traveling on this route would be anything but easy. Travelers had to descend more than a half mile in elevation to get to Jericho from Jerusalem. Jerusalem sits 2,300 feet above sea level, and the Dead Sea, where Jericho was located, sat at 1,300 feet below sea level. And those miles on that road look like this. Because of the contours and and the terrain with its jagged rocks and sharp turns and deep crevices, this region became popular hunting ground for robbers and thieves. This was the place where escaped prisoners used to hide out, and they would prey upon travelers on that route. Much of the time, authorities didn't even bother trying to find somebody or chasing somebody down in these hills because they knew it was too dangerous, and there were so many places 
for a crook to hide. So when Jesus tells this parable saying, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers who stripped him and beat him, leaving him half dead, his listeners knew what he was talking about. These are the kinds of things that occurred in this place. And if you think about it, I think we can understand why the priest who padded down the road, you know, I always kind of resented this parable because it made the clergy person look bad, you know. When he sees this body lying in the ditch, you know, he picks up the fringes of his robe and he scurries to the other side. The reason he did this is that he knew this was dangerous territory and that he might be the next victim. The robbers might be hiding out, ready to attack him. He also knew that it was a common practice for bandits to use decoys. And so one would act the part of the wounded man, and when an unsuspecting traveler stopped to assist, they would pounce on him. But more than just his own personal safety, this priest, being a holy man of God, was obliged to obey the laws of the priesthood, which set him apart from the others. And one of those laws was that you were not to touch the body of a dead man, and if you did, you were unclean for a period of seven days. Now, it's true that the man in the ditch was not dead, but this priest did not know that. And so he actually does exactly what is expected of him. He passes by on the other side. And so likewise, the Levite, another person of prominent status in Jewish society, briskly walked by on this man on this dangerous path because he was the one who was intimately involved with the rituals of the temple the heart of Hebrew worship. Now, there were many places of worship across the Holy Land in towns and villages. Those were the synagogues, but there was only one temple, and that was in Jerusalem. And the the Levite was the one who presided over the temple rituals, and it was a supreme honor for him to do this. And so seeing this man in the ditch, this Levi, he didn't dare defile himself with unholy contact or he might never be allowed to enter the inner sanctum of the, of the temple again. And perhaps he was tormented by what he, what he saw, and perhaps he wanted to help, but he, but he had to do what was in accordance to the law that he was sworn to obey. And so he walked by on the other side. You know, we often throw rocks at the priest and the Levite in this parable because they neglected to come to help of this man half beaten or beaten to death almost. And when you consider all the factors, though, their lack of action is understandable. You know, when it comes to helping people, as the Bible encourages us to do, doing the right thing is not always an easy decision. I know that when I've walked the streets of various cities and I encounter uh, sidewalk dwellers who extend their their hand in asking for assistance, some of them holding dirty cardboard signs with words like jobless or homeless or simply help written on them. And I wonder as I am approaching them, what is the right thing for me to do? I remember the words of Jesus in Matthew 25 when he said, I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you took care of me. And Jesus said, just as you did it to the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you did it to me. And it makes you wonder, well, if I pass by somebody in need, is that almost like passing by Jesus himself? And then I'm conflicted because, well, then what's going to happen if I give this person money? Is he going to use it for good purpose? Also, this person may not be in dire straits at all. He might be posing as someone in need so that he can take money from unsuspecting well-wishers. And when I think um, 
when it comes to helping others, God does not want us to be naive either. I remember one time when I was assigned to um, Fort Jackson in South Carolina for a short period, I pulled into a gas station late at night and I got out of my car to put gas in the car and a young woman who couldn't have been more than 25 years old said, sir, I was wondering if you would give me a ride home. And I said to her, you know, you really shouldn't be asking for a ride from a stranger late at night. And I didn't give her a ride. And afterwards, it occurred to me that, you know, what if I did? Where would she be taking me? Where might I end up? God does not want us to be naive. And yet that's what makes the actions of this Samaritan man in the story all the more astounding. The Samaritans despised enemies of people who considered themselves true Jews. They were a nation who had sold out. And the Jews and the Samaritans were always at odds. The Jews wanted nothing to do with them. And so a Jew, listening to this story, this is how he would expect it to go. A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. He fell among robbers. They beat him, stripped him, left him for dead. Along comes a priest, and he passes by on the other side, as well a Levite, as you would expect, does the same. And then along comes a Samaritan. And seeing this man stripped and beaten, promptly pounces on him and finishes him off. But that's not what happened. This despised Samaritan, the enemy, instead was moved with pity with what he saw. And he bandaged his wounds, poured oil and wine upon them. And then he put this this man, this person close to death, onto his own animal, probably a mule, and he brought him to an inn to take further care of him. And the next day he takes out money from his own pocket, gives it to the innkeeper, saying, take care of him, and when I come back, I will repay you whatever the costs have been to take care of him. So if the priest and the Levite, they did what was expected of them, what the Samaritan does is outrageous. Makes no sense. This man took risks. He went over to the man in the ditch, putting himself in a potentially dangerous situation, knowing it could be a trap, He broke the rules of his own faith about defilement. And he wasn't supposed to touch a dead person, let alone a a dead Jew. Yet, he decided in this moment, by way of his conscience, the right thing to do was to extend care to this despised enemy. The Samaritan sacrificed. He sacrificed effort, bandaging the man's wounds, pouring wine and oil upon them. He sacrificed his time by taking him on his own mule and taking him to this inn. Wherever that Samaritan was going on that journey on the road, he was going to be late. And he sacrificed money, which he was willing to spend to put the injured man at the inn and promised promised to repay whatever the costs to take care of him. So maybe we can appreciate the punch of this parable if we retell it in a more modern and familiar setting. I mean, imagine, if you will, a a, a family of disheveled, unkempt individuals stranded on the side of a road on a Sunday morning. They were in obvious distress. The mother sitting on a tattered suitcase hair uncombed, clothes in disarray, with a glazed look in her eyes, holding a a rag-clothed baby. The father, unshaven, dressed in coveralls with a a look of despair as he tries to corral two other children. Beside them was a run-down car that had obviously broken down. And so down the road comes a car, driven by the local bishop on his way to a church, and though the, the father and the, and the family are waving frantically, the bishop, bishop couldn't hold up, had to hold up because he didn't want to be late. And he acted as though he didn't see them. And then soon came another car, and again the father waved furiously, but the car was driven by the president of the Kiwanis Club, and, well, he was on his way to the airport to catch a flight for a national meeting, and that was important. 
And so he too acted as if he didn't see them. And then the next car came by, and it was driven by an outspoken atheist who had never been to church in his whole life. A guy who was known for petitioning to get religion out of the schools. And usually you could find him in the local pub after work where he told seamy stories and tales of his bravado. And yet when he saw this father on the side of the road and he saw this family, he was filled with compassion. He stopped his car, asked them where they were headed. He unlocked the doors, invited them to get in, the father in the front and the others in the back. He pulled into a local gas station, made a call to a towing company pleading that they send a tow car even though it was Sunday morning. And then he went to the grocery store and he purchased food for them. He assured them that he would pay for the towing of the car, he would pay for the cost of repairs, and then he took them to a local hotel and he said he would pay for that as well. He also paid for a rental car and gave them other cash for new clothes. Now this seems way, way out of whack. Yet that's something of how the original hearers of this story would hear that. Jesus wants to drive home the message that the neighbor in our lives may be the guy you would never expect to be your neighbor. God can work his grace through the actions of people you know and love as well as those who you may not know and would rather not love. <laughs> Are you kidding me, Jesus? Not this guy. Jesus also wants to show that being the neighbor and extending compassion involves risk. Now, even if it's not on the dramatic level as you see in this parable where the thieves and robbers are possibly lurking, whenever you reach out to another person, it may mean you are reaching out with a hand that might get slapped. You may be rejected. Reaching out involves sacrifice. The Good Samaritan sacrificed time, money, and also his own sweat as he hoisted this, this wounded person onto his animal. And he had to walk the distance instead of riding it himself. And you have to wonder then, what was going through the mind of this person who was beat up? What did he thought as he spent the night at the inn and he reflects on all that happened. Maybe he could recall this blur of robbers falling on him, stripping him of his clothes, and stealing his money, and beating him within an inch of his life. And then hours later, peering out a, a swollen eye, he sees a religious figure coming down the road and, and then passing by. And then another religious figure doing the same. And he passes by. And then he hears another set of footsteps, and that's a dreaded enemy, the final insult. But instead of more pain, he feels the soothing balm of oil poured upon his wounds, bandages being wrapped around his swollen legs, a joltingly painful and exhausting ride on the back of a mule, then finally rest. And he says to himself, you know, the world is not as I thought. How do I respond in light of what has been done for me? Well, we know what Jesus would say, just as he said to the one who asked him this question, who is my neighbor? He would say, go and do likewise. So we all have our own Jericho road that we walk. And there are plenty of others on that road ones who we have the chance to be a neighbor to. Amen. And now to him who by the power at work within us is able to do far more abundantly than we could ever ask or think, to him be the power and the glory now and forever. Amen and amen. I would ask if you could please stand for a short responsive litany and then we will go to our closing hymn. Please read responsibly. Who is my neighbor? The righteous and the unrighteous. 
just and the unjust. Who else is my neighbor? The rich and the poor, the powerless and the powerful. Is anyone else my neighbor? The popular and the unloved, the arrogant and the humble. All of us share a common bond as children of God. Which means my neighbor lives nearby and far away, shares my faith, and is of a different faith, votes as a Democrat and as a Republican. All of these are neighbors. And Jesus says, love your neighbor as yourself. We will love our neighbor as ourself. Our closing hymn is number 572. Thank you. 